out of anything in the room. It starts in Swordfish Trombones. He drags a chair across the room in the recording studio and it makes this huge screech. And he's like, let's keep that on the tape. The city allows you two meals and bed for one night only. It's a sort of twofold thing, really. It, it is what Parch represents, which is that, you know, he, he lived this strange kind of outsider life as a kind of hobo, as a homosexual, as someone who was certainly not kind of recognised in any way within the sort of canon of contemporary classical music. But more to the point, with that he was this sort of self-invented musicologist figure who built his own instruments, who was really pushing the envelope, trying to, um, you know, trying to invent a new kind of musical language. That really appealed to Waits. I mean, Waits was really questing for anything that took rock or American popular music outside of this, this sort of cliched setup of guitars and bass and drums and the three chords and everything that he was just so bored of, was so bored. So anyone who kind of said, you know, come with me, I mean, the great maxim of Parch was that I was a little boy who went outside, you know, went outside through in music. Waits wanted to go outside. Maybe not completely outside, but he wanted to, he, he really wanted to sort of venture into the wild. The sorts of textures that he was hearing in Parch's compositions and, and the recordings, both you know, before Parch's death and after his death, you know, really, really intrigued him and interested him, and particularly the textures of these sort of giant marimbas that, that Parch built, but other strange um, sound signatures and textures that he was hearing in Parch's music. I mean, this, he wanted to sort of bring this into his music, he wanted to create some sort of ambient sound field that was very different from orthodox, you know, rock, rock music. Perhaps one of the things that's been less remarked when Waits' music undergoes this quite revolutionary change, everybody has talked about his discovery of dissonance, but what goes with the dissonance is in fact uh, a far greater rhythmic impulse than has informed his music previously. And uh, I think that probably does very much come from the Harry Parch influence. These two things are running parallel. On the one hand, he's got this influence from Harry Parch, which is, which is very much a, a conceptual one. I remember him saying to me that he decided he wanted to know what a piano burning on the beach sounded like until the strings popped. And so that comes from Harry Parch. The marimba comes from Harry Parch. The idea of you know, the junkyard orchestra, the invented, made, homemade instruments comes from Harry Parch. But with all that comes this great rhythmic impetus, which is not something you'd have necessarily associated with his albums uh, from a previous period. And there were other classical music pioneers who emerged in the first half of the 20th century that Waits was drawn to. Kurt Weill, the distinctive stage composer who made his name in the 1920s, would become a major influence on his work after Swordfish Trombones. Weill, born in 1900 in Dessau, Germany, was a gifted pianist as a child and would later study composition with two of Europe's most prodigious talents, Engelbert Humperdinck and Ferruccio Busoni. He would go on to tread his own unique and distinctive path in classical music. After his apprenticeship with Busoni, Weill 
represented himself on the musical scenes with one-act operas, string quartets, the kind of thing that you would expect from a composer who was trained in the serious tradition. Bit by bit, though, he absorbed the popular culture that was prevalent in Weimar Berlin, and in 1927 met the poet and playwright Bertolt Brecht and decided to set some of Brecht's poems to music and set them using the idiom of the American popular song, created a hybrid which is literally represented in the title of that piece, Zongspiel. On the one hand, it's like a German Zingspiel, which is the German word for opera composed in the German vernacular. On the other hand, it has injected into it these, uh, these somewhat surreal American songs, some of them written in pidgin English. Oh, show us the way to the next whiskey bar. Oh, don't ask why. Oh, don't ask why. For we must find the next whiskey bar. For if we don't find the next whiskey bar, I tell you we must die. I tell you we must die. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you we must die. Oh, moon of Alabama, we now must say goodbye. We've lost our good old mama and must have whiskey, oh, you know why. Oh, Yet if the success of the Mahogany Zongspiel had indicated the potential of the Weil and Brecht partnership, their next production brought them to an even wider audience. Again, blending both classical and popular music, the pair set to work in 1928 in what would become their most celebrated achievement. Based on John Gay's 18th century English work, The Beggar's Opera, Weil and Brecht's 1928 production, The Threepenny Opera, combined a unique compositional style with a very modern Marxist approach to theatre. It was both revolutionary and a phenomenal success. This is part of this new classicality. They took a, a classical piece and they updated it, they modernized it. They injected into the musical idiom what was called at the time jazz. It was really a form of dance music. They threw in some of uh, the original music from the 18th century. This had been a smash hit in 1728. And in 1928, this revamped version of the Beggar's Opera, updated by Brecht in terms of the lyrics and the text, updated by Weil very much musically, became an absolute smash hit. Doch das Besser sieht man nicht. 